Sonalika, am I audible? Now you are ready. Okay. I was telling hi to everyone and I wasn't getting any response. Okay. Hi, Kavita. Hi, Saroop. Hi, Vishwa. Hi, Sandeep. How are you guys? Hi, Pi. How are you? I'm good. Hi, Urja. Welcome. Hi, Ruthvi. So nice to be here. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. Good. We may start the session in 10 minutes as soon as others join. Thank you. Sure, sure.
Hi, Netra. How are you? Good to have you over here. Hi. Finally, yes. So Nadika, can we please make Urja and Netra as the co-host? So Nalika, can you hear me? Can you please make Urja and Netra as co-host so that we can start with this session? Okay, so hello and welcome everybody. I warmly welcome you to the session of Psyomics Club titled Applying Transcriptomics Gene Expression Data Analysis for Neuroscience Project. So for the presenters today, we have Urja Parekh. She was Omics Logic Research Fellow in 2020. She did her BS in Biomedical Sciences from SVKM's Manage Monji Institute of Management Studies. The project she did was differential identification of biomarkers between normal neural stem cells and glioblastoma stem cells. After completing her project, she went ahead and published her paper, the picture you can see over here. So I warmly welcome you, Urja. And the second present for today is Netra Srinivasan. She was also a Omics Logic Research Fellow in 2020. She is a student at Leland High School and the project title is Effects of Onset of Menopause on Transcriptomics Profiling of Female Brain. So first Urja will present followed by Netra's presentation but before starting with the presentations I would like to brief you all about what Psyomics Club is. So Psyomics is a bioinformatics and data science student club which is a joint initiative taken by students associated with Pine Biotech. Our main goal is to help students learn about bioinformatics research via group sessions, easy to take courses, debates and discussions. We not only do this, but also aim to encourage young minds to push their critical thinking limits beyond the school and college curriculum. I am Rudvi Vaja, president of Psyomics Club and also serving as a campus ambassador at Pine Biotech. I am an undergraduate third year student of integrated biomedical sciences. For the last session, in the last week, we did an astrobiology session, which was again presented by our research fellows, that is Shubrajit and Dilara Diken. They presented the projects on astrobiology. For today's session, we, as already discussed, we have Urja and Netra to present on neuroscience project uses, using transcriptomics gene expression data analysis. For further on, what do we do in our weekly Psyomics Club meeting is that we have interactive Zoom sessions, we have debates, and we discuss certain kinds of uh, review report writing or certain kinds of crucial health topics which could be important in bioinformatics big data analysis. 
So our main goal is to provide training in bioinformatics, enable independent research that is guided by mentors and peer example. Not only this, but we also wish to develop a growing community full of students, researchers, and even mentors for the data-driven research and appreci appreciation of science, citizen science. We also help enable students, clinicians, and faculties of all the backgrounds of life sciences and bioinformatics to develop novel and independent research projects using latest technology in life and data sciences. We cover topics like infectious diseases, neuroscience, plant science, precision oncology, microbes, and microbiome. This helps us to ap apply the knowledge of application of big data into biology. Not only this, but we also help students clear basic concepts of bioinformatics in our weekly sessions. We help them to gain insight on to how to use the tools of bioinformatics by demonstrating live hands-on experiments. We also help them understand the applications of coding in bioinformatics and certain specific experience on data science skill sets. So for to begin with your journey for Sciomics Club and with Pine Biotech, you need to make an account on Omics Logic, whose link would be shortly shared in the chat box. Once you, this is like a home page of Omics Logic where you need to enter your email ID and then the password. We also have social groups on Sciomics Club that is on Slack channel. We have Omics Logic groups on LinkedIn and also on Facebook. The links would be shared in the chat box. Moving on, we also provide free courses that is Introduction to Bioinformatics and Introduction to Genomics. These are self-learning courses, easy to take without paying anything, and one can learn the basics of bioinformatics by enrolling themselves into these courses. Furthermore, we also offer premium courses like Bioinformatics Machine Learning, Genomics, Transcriptomics, Metagenomics, and Machine Learning. So these are premium courses, which you have to pay some amount in order to learn. But we provide these courses at very cheap rates and they are very useful if you want to get started with bioinformatics. We also have group discussions as talked about in which we have debate on mind boggling arenas and certain crucial topics in bioinformatics. We have presentations by PhD scholars, research fellows of all their research work or their published work. And we also have scientific discussions and debates in order to exchange the ideas for project development and for the research and development. As told, you can connect with us on the Slack channel, that is the Sciomics Slack channel. Over here, we help everyone to get know about the latest upcoming events, webinars and everything. We also have LinkedIn group for Pine Biotech where we post about most of the upcoming sessions and webinars. We also have our Telegram group in which we talk about uh, the upcoming members, upcoming webinars and everything. And for the Slack channel, we also have Omics Logic Research Fellowship Slack channel in which we discuss the technical criteria of the project. So everyone who is doing a research or is a research fellow associated with Pine Biotech can join this Omics Logic Research Fellowship uh, Slack channel in which we discuss the technical part of it if someone is having any problems encountering in their way of project and further on. And how to join the Omics Club? This is the WhatsApp group link. You can you join the club using this WhatsApp group link. And also we welcome all the ages because we think that knowledge has no boundaries. Thank you very much for listening this patiently. I may invite now Urja to share her screen and start with her presentation. Urja, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ritri, for that kind introduction. And um, I'm so happy to see how much um, Pine Bio has grown. And Sciomix is a great initiative um, to spread information about bioinformatics. Um, and I can personally attest to the fact that bioinformatics is extremely useful in biology and um, it will take every student ahead in their academic future. So it will put you at the top amongst other students. So um, I'll share my screen now. And uh, I hope my presentation is visible. Yes, Urja, it is visible, thank you. Okay, so um, last year I was a research fellow with Pine Biotech um, and the title of my project was different initially, but this is the final title with which uh, we have also released our preprint. 
which is in silico analysis and characterization of differentially expressed genes to distinguish glioma stem cells from normal neural stem cells. So uh, it it sounds quite complex, but I will. Kulsha, yeah. Just a minute. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Can you just on your video because we are live on YouTube? Okay, sure, sure. Thank you. Hold on a second. Okay, I hope I'm visible. Yes, good to go. Awesome. Right. Uh, okay. Right. So I will break down uh, the aspects of this research project for you all to understand. Uh, but before I proceed, I'll just speak a little bit about myself. I recently completed my master's in biomedical science from Sanandan Devetia School of Science, which is a part of the NMIMS University in Mumbai. I'm currently working at a hospital in Mumbai, which is Kokila Bain Hirubai Ambani Hospital, and I'm involved in several research projects here. I'm also a visiting research fellow at Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. Uh, I'm working remotely at the moment, and this particular non-for-profit organization is based out of the US. So um, coming to my research endeavors, in 2016, I began my undergrad studies in biomedical science, where I was introduced to vast areas of biology, including neurobiology, cell biology, molecular biology, bio a lot of these subjects. And um, it was neuroscience that uh, really elicited my interest. So after that, in 2018, I interned at St. Xavier's uh, College, which is again in Mumbai where I was involved in two research projects. In one, I identified two novel strains of yeast and characterized them. And in the other, I created a PUC-18 vector, which has a gene binding domain from yeast. Uh, in my final year of graduation, uh, undergrad, I also synthesized nanoparticles using a plant extract. In 2020, um, I had actually lost a very important research fellowship, which was supposed to happen in Canada. And that's when I actually searched for Pine Biotech and I remotely interned with them for a period of three months. And that's when I performed this particular analysis. And now uh, I'm working at uh, Kukila Bain Hirubayambani Hospital, as I said, where I have completed my master's thesis and I'm working on establishing two proteins, S100B and GFAP as biomarkers for diseases like intracerebral hematoma and traumatic brain injury. Um, I've also established a machine learning algorithm that diagnoses acute kidney injury in patients. Um, and now further, I also wish to pursue a PhD. So coming to my project, um, please feel free to ask me any questions in the chat. I will come back to those um, after the presentation is done. So let's talk about glioblastoma multiform, which is GBM. Um, this particular type of brain cancer is a primary brain tumor, which is extremely malignant, extremely aggressive. Um, and a patient who gets this particular type of cancer has an overall survival period of only 15 months post therapy. So um, it's difficult uh, to increase their survival time. And that is mostly owing to um, the etiology of this cancer. So ca scientists still don't know where this cancer is arising from. Uh, right, so we know the uh, place, which is the subventricular zone in the brain, uh, where these particular type of cancers usually originate, but how is what is unknown. So currently there are two hypotheses uh, that tell us about the origin of glioblastoma. One states that normal neural stem cells can accumulate mutations, undergo transformation and form this particular type of cancer. And the second hypothesis states that cancer stem cells uh, are tumor initiating cells uh, that may directly cause the origin of this particular type of cancer. So now this particular, these two hypotheses have been widely debated since years. It is also important to understand that cancer stem cells also impart radio resistance and chemo resistance in these particular types of cancer. So glioblastoma is popularly known for its recurrence. So after the first tumor has been treated, the tumor tends to relapse and come back again. Uh, and these particular types of secondary tumors are more radio resistant uh, and therefore difficult to treat. So what is, as I said, what is unknown is what are the differences or what are the similarities between cancer stem cells? And in this case, we will call the cancer stem cells glioma stem cells. 
uh, so also abbreviated as GFEs. So are glioma stem cells similar to normal neural stem cells or are they different? Um, it is essential to understand the differences between these two types of stem cells uh, because if we identify genetic and epigenetic differences, we can also understand what exactly is the reason why glioblastoma is malignant. And we can also target particular proteins or genes that may be the most important in driving this particular type of cancer. So using precision medicine, we will be able to improve therapeutic efficacy. And therefore, in order to answer the question whether they are similar or different, we have performed RNA-seq analysis to identify the genetic differences between uh, normal neural stem cells and glioma stem cells. So how have we done this? The first step in RNA-seq analysis is to collect data. Uh, because of course, this is not a wet lab project. This is done on a computer. So we have to find existing databases and existing data sets to perform our experiments. Uh, so there is um, a website or, or a database, which is called GEO, G -E -O, uh, which is uh, a part of NCBI. Uh, so on this particular database, you get, it's a repository of RNA sequences where you get different types of RNA, sample, RNA sequence samples of different types of cancers or different types of organisms. So you go on this particular database and you have to go through multiple projects to see which one fits your criteria the best. So I fortunately found a great data, uh, data set of RNA sequences uh, in which the uh, person had uh, isolated RNA sequence from glioma stem cells as well as normal neural stem cells. Uh, so that uh, the particular code for this particular data set was GSC 132172, which you can actually go check on the internet. Now they had uh, a sample size of 188 samples. However, because the data is too large, we only selected 40 samples, 20 of glioma stem cells and 20 of normal neural stem cells. The next step is to uh, take this RNA sequence and make sense of it. And we do that using RNA-seq analysis, right? So we analyze data using certain pipelines. So uh, this entire analysis has been done on the Pine Biotech uh, platform. So what you essentially do is you take the RNA sequence that you obtained from the internet and you align these particular RNA sequences to the human genome. Uh, at the end of this, you get the gene counts of every gene that has been expressed in either glioma stem cells or normal neural stem cells. And after that, in order to understand how differently certain genes are expressed in these two types of uh, stem cell samples, you perform differential gene expression analysis. And for that, you use a pipeline called DSeq2. So this is like the general idea of what RNA-seq analysis is. Then, once you have got the abundance of gene uh, expression in these two types of samples, and once you know how differently they are expressed in these two types of stem cells, you have to perform gene ontology studies, which basically means that uh, you have um, identified certain genes that are of importance, but you need to understand what their functions are. Uh, so I will, of course, be talking about, more, uh, about this in more detail. So coming to the results. So after performing the RNA-seq pipeline, as I already showed you, uh, we started with a total of 27,385 genes at the beginning, uh, which were enriched in these two types of stem cells. Now this is a large, uh, it's a huge number of genes. So we have to uh, so set certain thresholds to identify the most significant genes that may be playing a role in driving this particular type of cancer. So um, after you perform differential gene expression analysis that gives you an idea of what genes are upregulated and downregulated in these stem cells, you have to choose the significance value, which is usually lesser than 0.05. And you have to also look at the log to fold change value. So this uh, is basically an indicator of the abundance of gene expression. Uh, so for this uh, particular project, we had kept it uh, greater than 3 for GSEs and lesser than minus 3 for NSEs. I'll be explaining that further. So from 27,385 genes, we finally came down to the top 50 most significant genes that might be involved in driving glioblastoma multiform. So once you have got the uh, gene expression uh, from or the gene abundance from the RNA-seq analysis, the first step that you have to do is a principal component, component analysis, which is a type of dimensionality reduction, um, where you, so basically in these graphs, you can see that glioma stem cells and normal neural stem cells have separated and clustered 
quite apart from each other, which basically shows that these two types of stem cells are indeed different in terms of their genetic expression, right? So that was our first clue that normal neural stem cells and glioma stem cells are actually genetically different. To confirm these findings, we also perform the type of uh, machine learning algorithm, which is hierarchical clustering. Over here, again, we confirm that normal neural stem cells cluster together, glioma stem cells cluster together. We also found an important outlier sample. Now, this outlier sample was actually a glioma stem cell sample, which actually clustered in between normal neural stem cells and glioma stem cells. Um, we believe that this particular outlier sample might be an important clue uh, about how normal neural stem cells can actually transform to glioma stem cells because it technically lies in between. Uh, and it might be uh, giving us hints about the transformation process of stem, like a normal neural stem cells to a cancerous phenotype. The next thing that we did was perform differential gene expression analysis. And uh, like after you run the pipeline, you get uh, several types of graphs. So one of them is a volcano plot that you can see on this particular slide. So uh, you can see these dots that are in blue. Uh, so they are genes that are highly expressed in either types of stem cell samples. So um, uh, as you can see, there are so many genes. Not all of them are the most significant ones. So as I already mentioned to you all, that we have to choose the most significant ones. And for that, we use the p-adjusted value, which is, which is supposed to be lesser than 0 0.05. And we also look at the log two fold change value, which tells us what are the most um, abundantly uh, differentially uh, expressed genes, right? So um, over here, supposing you take normal neural stem cells, you see S100A11, UDD, MGST1, Serpin F1, so these are the most abundantly differentially expressed genes that you may find in normal neural stem cells. And similarly, in glioma stem cells, you have S100B, S100A6, PLP1, which are more important candidates. So by setting these particular thresholds, we identified 192 genes that were significantly upregulated in glioma stem cells and 156 genes that were significantly downregulated in glioma stem cells in comparison to normal neural stem cells. So that is in total, we had 348 gene candidates that may be important in driving gliomagenesis. So what do you do of these 348 genes, right? So that's when gene ontology comes in. So what we did was we took these particular gene sets that we had obtained from differential gene expression analysis and loaded it on um, David and Keg. So these two are uh, online repositories again, where you can upload your gene data and it will provide you details about uh, where your genes are involved, in what kind of diseases, in what kind of cell signaling pathways, what exactly is the function of the genes that you have got in your project. So what I saw with my results was that the genes that I had identified were mostly enriched in diseases such as Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, ADHD, autism, myocardial infarction, but there was no involvement of these particular genes with gliomagenesis, which, gives, give, which gave us the first hint that uh, the genes that we have obtained in our study are novel and their indication in gliomagenesis has still not been studied. So, um, okay, so over here you see that there are uh, several uh, pathways in which our genes have been involved in. So the ones that you can see with a, a star marked in red, so these ankyrin uh, is one protein that was found in my particular gene list, uh, which was shown to be enriched in um, the glioma stem cells. So this particular protein ankyrin is responsible for cell growth migration and proliferation. Um, then we had SDC4 and uh, alpha-2 beta-1, which is an integrin, which are responsible for angiogenesis, again, and migration and proliferation pathways. Other integrins that were again involved in tumor cell and invasion pathways. We saw the wind protein that was enriched in a particular data set, which is uh, again responsible for proliferation and survival of tumor cells. The VEGF, uh, which is one of the most uh, common uh, angiogenesis factors that drives uh, tumor promotion. So we saw all these particular genes were uh, involved in our particular gene sets. Again, we had TGF beta pathway. So we had genes like lumetan and caviolin, which were involved, which drive apoptosis and growth suppression, which may be upregulated or downregulated or mutated in our particular types of stem cell samples. 
So overall, this basically shows that the genes that we obtained in our study or identified in our study are involved in several tumorigenesis pathways. You might be knowing that uh, there are certain hallmarks of cancers, and these particular hallmarks of cancers are pathways by which tumors evade, say, um, the immune cells or they continue growth. So we have a clear indication that the genes in my study are involved in the hallmarks of cancers. So again, 348 genes that we considered in our study were again too many. So we again need to identify the most important one. So what I did was I filtered the only top 15 most highly differentially expressed genes, right? So the ones that are more abundantly expressed in either normal neural stem cells or glioma stem cells, those are the ones that I considered for further literature review. Uh, again, uh, using those top 50 genes that I selected, I again carried out principal component analysis and saw that the separation of glioma stem cells and normal neural stem cells is still vast and therefore they differ significantly uh, considering these 50 genes and their expression and uh, that the genes uh, that are upregulated in glioma stem cells are downregulated in normal neural stem cells and the ones that are upregulated in normal neural stem cells are downregulated in glioma stem cells, which you can see in this heat map. So uh, then what I did was I performed the literature review of those 50 genes. And what I saw was that uh, while we had identified several candidates which have an already known association in gliomagenesis, for example, S100B, S100A6, GPNMB, which were upregulated in glioma stem cells. Uh, and there were genes like S100A11, UBB, SERPNF1, which were downregulated in glioma stem cells. These genes have already been studied by scientists and have a known um, involvement in this particular type of cancer. But more importantly, we, find, we found genes that have still no known studies performed and uh, are actually, uh, if we study it more, we will actually find they are involved in gliomagenesis. So uh, these genes which have no previous known association with gliomagenesis are ITM2A, KRBOX1, uh, we also found several um, unidentified genes. So these are completely novel genes, uh, which have still not been discovered by scientists. So uh, these particular genes actually need to be um, studied in more detail by uh, people who are working in labs and identify their roles um, in gliomagenesis. So to conclude uh, my findings, I identified 348 significantly differentially expressed genes in glioma stem cells and normal neural stem cells right, with a stringent um, threshold value. These genes that I found in my pathways were involved in uh, hallmarks of cancer, like PGF, beta, wind signaling, and angiogenesis pathways. I identified several genes that have no known association with gliomagenesis and therefore are very good candidates to study in order to understand better how this cancer progresses in the brain. Um, I believe that uh, future studies on these particular candidates um, can reveal important targets for therapy, so they can act as good biomarkers for either diagnosis or prognosis, or they can be targeted via precision medicine. Uh, finally, the outlier sample that I mentioned earlier, I think uh, having more studies on that particular type of samples would reveal hints uh, regarding how normally your stem cells can transform to glioma stem cells or directly to the cancerous phenotype. Uh, so yeah, so those were the results of my studies and these are just three most important references in my study. Uh, at this point, I would like to acknowledge uh, the entire team at Pine Biotech, uh, Dr. Mohit Mazumdar, uh, Ilya Sir, um, and uh, Harpreet Kaur, who have uh, been extremely crucial in this project and uh, for their help in supporting me throughout. Uh, and I would also like to thank Ritvi and the entire Sciomics team for um, inviting me and allowing me to present my work. Um, I would also like to state that um, I have presented this particular work at several international and national conferences, and I have won several um, awards for the same. So yeah, I think um, Pine Biotech has been uh, so helpful in uh, helping me develop my own uh, profile, my research profile. And this particular uh, research study has also gained a lot of um, accolades. Uh, so I believe that uh, all of you all should learn bioinformatics because it's a great field. It's a very interesting field. 
and if you are ever planning to apply for a phd bioinformatics is a very crucial skill to have um so yeah i hope this um session was helpful if you all have any questions uh, i can answer them now and you can always email me on my email id which is mentioned here thank you Urja, that was an amazing presentation, and how significantly you have grown makes me so happy to see how much you have progressed and all. So thank you so much again for presenting. I had a question that uh, what exactly does need to be studied for that outlier in order to see the transformation from neural to glioblastoma prognosis? Right. Um. Again. Um. That's a great question, Ruthi. Uh. One thing that we have not done in this particular study is um, look at the genetic differences in comparison to the uh, complete tumor population, right? So we have only looked at okay. stem cell populations. Uh, if we compare this particular outlier sample along with the normal, so normal neural stem cell sample, so this particular outlier was a glioma stem cell sample. So what we can do is correlate the genetic findings. With the normal neural stem cell samples as well as the glioma femur, the actual tumor, the entire tumor, instead of just looking at the uh, stem cells. Good. With that, we will be able to see how much uh, similarity is there in the genetic uh, expression. Uh, how much is it close to the glioblastoma phenotype, and how much is it close to the normal neural stem cell phenotype? So we will actually be able to see uh, like a progression of uh, genetic changes. So, if in a normal neural stem cell, a particular gene is um, not uh, is downregulated, maybe in this particular outlier sample, it is mildly upregulated, and maybe in the cancers, the entire cancers phenotype, uh, if we compare that particular gene is very highly upregulated. So, we can actually see those kind of differences and uh, understand whether um, is it like a, a progressive behavior in the pattern of gene expression. That is one way to study it. Of course, there will be other ways to study um, outlier samples, which I will actually have to uh, look into. But uh, I can get back to you on that for sure. Thanks, Urja. We do have another question from Riday. He's asking, uh, he's telling great work and really insightful. And he has a question that, can you please elaborate the steps you use to find the differentially expression of genes? Thank you, Riday. So, um, okay, let me just go back to that slide. Yeah, so see, after RNA seq analysis, you get something called a gene count table. Okay, so after that, you are supposed to, um, uh, I'm talking only technically, what you're supposed to do is uh, you take the gene count table and then you have to actually normalize your uh, gene counts. And you have to also remove all the background noise that may be there. So uh, you have to quantile normalize it. After you have got, after you have processed your gene counts, you have to basically upload those gene count uh, data onto the platform, and you have to run this pipeline, which is the differential gene expression pipeline, which is DC2. So what this pipeline essentially does is uh, tells us how different is the expression of a particular gene in comparison to the control sample. So for example, if glioma stem cell, uh, I want to look at the expression of a particular gene in glioma stem cell, uh, my control would be a normal neural stem cell. So what happens in this particular type of uh, pipeline, you get how much more is a particular gene expressed in the glioma stem cell in comparison to normal neural stem cell, right? So um, the, over here, it's pretty straightforward. All you need to do is uh, upload your gene counts and uh, then run this particular pipeline. And after that, after you, um, you get that particular pipeline, you'll again get like a huge uh, amount of data, right? So when you get that data, you have to, so you will get several columns where you will have different parameters of each gene. So if you have started with say um, 27,000 genes, the, after you run this particular pipeline, you will get only those particular genes that are differentially expressed when, when there is a difference in expression of those genes. So what you will get along with each gene is the p-value. So if your p-value is greater than 0.05, then that means that the difference in gene expression is not significant. So you have to automatically eliminate those particular genes. Then the genes that uh, have a significance value lesser than 0.05, 
you need to consider those. Again, you will still end up with a lot of genes. So again, you need to filter them. Then you look at the log fold change value where you see uh, the genes that are the most abundantly expressed in a particular sample. So when you actually look at the data, it would be simpler for you to understand what I'm saying. Uh, you have to select the highest values in order to um, identify only a few genes that may be of relevance. I hope um, I made it, made it slightly more clear for so that. Urja, one more last question we have from the YouTube sharing. Uh, so Prima is asking what exactly brain cells are transforming into tumor cells. I mean, she means to say that what types of brain cells are transforming into tumor cells. Okay, so Rima, good question. Uh, these are stem cells. So glioblastoma, um, currently the hypothesis are that glioblastoma arises from stem cells. These stem cells are usually found in the subventricular zone of the brain, right? So... Uh, even in a normal person who does not have this cancer, there are a population of stem cells that are present in that particular area of the brain. Um, what happens in patients with glioblastoma, these particular types of stem cells may mutate. Sorry, what? Okay, so um, what I was saying was those stem cells that are present in that portion of the brain can mutate and when a lot of mutations accumulate, they can become cancerous. Um, so that is the current hypothesis around which we believe that glioblastoma arises from. I hope that answers your question, Rima. Yes, thank you, Urja. Any more questions, you can put it down in the chat box. Urja will answer at the last once we finish Netra's presentation. Thank you so much, Urja, for sharing. And we definitely have a lot to learn from you. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to Netra's presentation. Sure. Hi, Netra. Can you hear me? Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes, Netra, I am. A very warm welcome over here and we are glad to have you. Thank you. Finally. Me. Yeah. So can you please share your screen and go ahead with your presentation? Yes. Thank you. All right, are you able to see my uh, slides? Yes, Nate, right, it's visible. All right, awesome. So hello everybody, thank you for having me. Uh, my research project is uh, basically investigating the effects of the onset of menopause on the transcriptomic profile of the aging female brain. So I am Nathra Srinivasan from Leland High School in San Jose, California, in the US. And I am interested in bioinformatics because of the flexibility it provides to do biological research. And the interdisciplinary field of bioinformatics allows me to explore data and draw conclusions in a new way. And I've been attracted to research for years because I'm able to learn new things hands-on and draw conclusions from my work which is very satisfying to me and i look forward to the future research that i do as well learning from this experience so to start off with the significance of the problem so we know that there is a divergence in the occurrence of neurodegenerative diseases between males and females but the mechanisms so far are unknown so Mishra et al. Uh, validated the divergence between human males and females through microarray profiling. But for example, more than 5.5 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's disease, of whom two thirds are elderly women. And the mitochondria of young females are protected against the pathologies of Alzheimer's disease compared to males, but this advantage is lost in older females. And moreover, current Alzheimer's disease treatments only target neurotransmitters to treat the symptoms, but not the root cause. And thus it's important to figure out the underlying factors to be able to better target treatment 
through identifying transcriptomic differences to identify the genes at play and pinpoint the pathways for treatment. So previous research has investigated immune profiles in menopausal rats, but the overall effects are yet to be interpreted. And so understanding the genes expressed differently in the progressive stages of female aging and menopause can help us understand risks for neurodegeneration and pathways to treat in order to treat neurodegeneration such as for Alzheimer's disease in women. And so through this research, doctors and researchers will be able to take the occurrence of menopause into account when developing treatments for neurodegenerative um, diseases, which significantly affects more females than males. And so to summarize, current treatments only address the symptoms, but do not target the root cause. So therefore, understanding the genes expressed differently in the progressive stages of female aging and menopause can help us understand the risks for neurodegeneration and pathways to treat these diseases, such as uh, Alzheimer's disease in women more effectively. And so through understanding that the onset of menopause plays a role in the risks for neurodegenerative diseases, uh, possible treatments involving uh, estrogen or progesterone, which play a role in modulating menstrual cycles and menopause could reverse the effects of menopause, thus opening a revolutionary pathway for the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases. So to talk a little bit about female aging in general. So menopause is the end of a female's uh, menstrual cycle and fertility in which the ovaries no longer produce estrogen uh, and progesterone. So humans undergo menopause, but another organism that also undergoes menopause are rats. So in this uh, uh, research project, uh, we use data from rats and so they follow the same, the similar uh, menopause uh, phase as humans, in which first at about six months for rats, uh, they undergo premenopause, in which they have the normal estrus cycles. And then after that, they transition to perimenopause at around nine months, in which the cycles are real irregular, but have not completely stopped. And then after that, with sometime within those nine months, they transition into menopause. And then uh, at about 15 months, they're at post-menopause. And so post-menopause in humans is basically the year mark from the final cycle. And so that's basically the transitional um, phases of menopause in rats. So, uh, for in terms of the aging of the female brain, um, so far we know that there is, uh, as the brain ages, there is an increased immune response, but we'd like to take a look at the overall um, effects as well. So to transition on to the data set distribution uh, for my study, so so far there, so in my study, uh, there are six groups with six samples each. So there is the female rat at six months, which we've abbreviated as reg 6 m And then there's the female rat at nine months uh, with a normal cycle, then nine months with an irregular cycle, nine months an acyclic, then nine months at OVX and 16 months uh, and they are acyclic. Uh, so basically the OVX uh, is important because it acts as a control group in which it highlights the most important clinical features of estrogen deficiency uh, induced um, or postmenopausal conditions. So um, to summarize my research question and hypothesis, so understanding the genes expressed differently in the progressive stages of female aging and menopause can help us understand the risks for neurodegeneration and pathways to target in order to treat neurodegeneration such as Alzheimer's disease for women. So there were a couple of questions that came up from this. So firstly, how does the age or time of the onset of menopause affect the transcriptomic expression and which pathways are affected? 
Um, are there biomarkers in menopausal women that or menopausal females that helps us identify their risk for certain neurodegenerative disorders? And how does the expression differ uh, in overectomized specimens and regular specimens? And can this lead to insights on the onset of neurodegenerative disease? And so then, then comes my central question, and what are the effects of the onset of menopause on the transcriptomic profile of the aging female brain? So for my methodology, uh, I had to s compare six groups. So I then used principal component analysis, um, differential gene expression analysis, uh, to identify the significant genes, and I used hierarchical clustering. Um, then uh, I looked at the significantly expressed genes and uh, did functional annotation on David and, and Richard to uh, visualize the uh, expressed pathways or the pathways that are upregulated and downregulated, such as neuroinflammation or neurodegeneration, et cetera, and relating the expression to each other to draw conclusions and analyze which genes are underexpressed um, or overexpressed uh, in the six groups. So firstly, um, with PCA, I compared the regular groups versus the acyclic groups and the regular versus irregular, and I got these PCA plots um, in which uh, there is a divergence between the regular and acyclic and the regular and uh, irregular. And so what I did is I basically, for, with these um, uh, uh, plots, I formed uh, my plan for doing differential expression in which I split it into regular versus acyclic and regular versus irregular. So um, with further PCA um, using the significant genes, um, we can see that there are two clusters and there's also a divergence um, between the regular groups and the overectomized group with the two clusters. Um, and also through differential expression, I obtained um, these two plots showing the significant genes. Um, and these are also other plots obtained by differential expression. Um, so for the path to summarize the pathways that were upregulated and downregulated, so for regular versus um, irregular uh, and regular versus acyclic, uh, the pathways that were upregulated were related to the immune system, and the pathways that were downregulated um, uh, were related to uh, the mitochondria. Um, and neurodegenerative disorders such as oxidative phosphorylation, um, Alzheimer's, uh, and things like that. So they share 583 genes downregulated and 550 genes upregulated. And so uh, the downregulation is the oxidative phosphorylation, um, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. So things related to mitochondrial dysfunction and the pathways that were upregulated were um, zinc and metal binding, which are all related to the immune system. So I also did hierarchical clustering and in the dendrograms, uh, we can see that there are two that the um, regular and the acyclic groups and the regular and irregular groups um, are separated into two clusters, showing that they are indeed different. Um, and also uh, through the pathway analysis visual, visualized um, on Enricher, um, we can see uh, for the regular versus irregular, um, which pathways are upregulated, um, which are downregulated, and same thing for regular versus acyclic, which pathways are upregulated and which pathways um, are downregulated. So for my conclusion and discussion, so firstly, I found that uh, there is a clear distinction between the transcriptomics of the regular rats shifting to irregular and acyclic phases. So our, our analysis clearly indicates that there's an impact on the transcriptomics of the rat, especially in relation to the mitochondrial function, leading to near degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease and thus supporting current pathologies. 
And so with the upregulation of zinc regulated pathways, the immune response was heightened. Um, and it's also evident that menopause and not only age is a factor for the differential expression due to the divergence between the overectomized and the regular groups, thus controlling for age and signif signifying a difference between the regular and postmenopausal conditions. And so the study sheds light on the targeting of possible treatments for neurodegenerative diseases caused by oxidative stress. And through understanding that the transitioning of menopause plays a role in uh, exacerbating oxidative stress, damaging the mitochondria, the direct hormones modulating menopause uh, can be controlled. And so once the root cause of the oxidative stress is removed, the damaged mitochondrial membrane actually is able to uh, bounce back to original condition which may be revolutionary for neurodegenerative recovery. So possible limitations of the study include the sample size and the data collection procedures, which I was unable to do myself. And it's also based on only rat samples and it's not validated on human samples yet. So further exploration on the lack of estrogen and progesterone themselves require um, exploration. And so that's for further research. I'd like to generate a controlled data set with menopausal rats supplemented with estrogen and progesterone to investigate the effects as well um, as investigate this phenomenon in humans. So thank you for this opportunity to present my uh, project and I'm open to any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Netra. That was an amazing presentation too. Good work. So I have one question. Can we conclude from this project that every woman who enters her menopausal stage would uh, have uh, chances of getting neurodegenerative disorder or can we not put it in this way? Um, we can say that there is, well, the thing is that we can't uh, really conclude, uh, we can't really say anything in conclusive terms that every single woman because firstly this has to be validated um in humans because this is this project is currently done in rats but we can say that there is a possible chance uh of that phenomenon to occur and so through doing extra um through doing further research on um, this phenomenon um, in humans uh, we might be able to make that conclusion Thank you. And also, we do have one question from YouTube online streaming. Uh, Prima is asking that, uh, does menopause occur in all female organism at some particular time or age period in which this mechanisms take place? Um, I'm not sure if menopause happens in every organism, but I do know that it happens in most mammals. Um, and so menopause, it typically is towards the end of the fertility cycle for uh, organisms that do have menopause uh, because of the general aging. Um, so I hope that answers uh, that question. So because rats are mammals and humans are also mammals, um, menopause occurs. Also, we do have uh, one more question from Zulfikar Mehdi. She says, you have given the nice talk. And also, can you name some noteworthy targets with therapeutic advantage in neurodegenerative diseases? Hmm. Um, so, so far for neurodegenerative diseases, um, like for Alzheimer's, the way that they treat it is by um, treating the symptoms like for example um, they target um, acetylcholine or dopamine but that only targets the symptoms whereas for the root cause which could be related to menopause um, they could possibly uh, target the pathway involving um, estrogen and progesterone uh, modulation because with menopause, 
uh, estrogen, the difference between, um, you know, regular cycling and in menopause is that estrogen and progesterone um, are not produced. And so possibly um, through uh, adding uh, through adding uh, estrogen and progesterone back into the pathway, um, there might be some therapeutic advantage to that. But since it hasn't been tested, we don't really know for sure. Oh, can it, can it be any protein um, or gene regulation? No, we haven't. I haven't investigated that in my uh, study. Uh, thanks, Neta, for answering that question. Uh, what I think for Zulfikar is maybe you should go through some literature review uh, on this particular topic of neurodegeneration and protein regulation. There are many on NCBI because this question is very broad in itself and it just cannot be answered from one perspective or one project of a view. So that would be helpful for you, I guess. And if you need some more literature review, you can surely reach out to me. I'll help you. Thank you. Any more questions for Netra? Okay, if there are any more questions, you can put it down in the chat box. Thank you so much, Netra, for sharing with us your wonderful project. We have a lot from you to learn as well. Thank you for being with us. We are glad to have you. Thank can you I? Me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sonalika? Uh, uh, over here, Sonalika would tell you about the upcoming events and webinars from Pine Biotech. Sonalika, you may share your screen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruthvi, and thank you so much, Urja and Netra, for such wonderful presentations and showcasing your work as well. I hope it would have helped a number of people here to uh, know more about how transcriptomic data could be analyzed and visualized as well. So let, let me just quickly take you through our portal that is learn.omicslogic. And if you have already signed up to the portal, it's great. If you have not done so far, uh, here is the link, you can sign up now. And those who have already signed up, I would request them to please update their profile. And by updating profile, I mean, please add your profile picture and also link in your social. Now, this is because we want the correct name of yours uh, in your profile, because that would be reflecting in your certificates as well. And to have your social links, it's just because we have been having recruiters over the time and we share good profiles with them. And also we would be featuring uh, you on your performance on, over our social. So we would want your social linked too. And now coming to the research fellowship program. So Netra and Urja were a part of a research fellowship program and they did such wonderful projects in the program itself. So even if you wish to be a part of the research fellowship program and carry out your independent research project under mental guidance, you can register yourself uh, on this page, the link I've shared with you. All you need to do is just register yourself to the page and uh, you can also go through the page to clear your doubts. And uh, we have answered for you frequently asked questions over here. And also we have added the progress, like what would be the steps you would have to follow in the research fellowship program and what all you would have to go through. You can go through the program page as well and also i'm sharing with you a blog which you can refer to learn more about the research fellowship program and also you can go through the projects as of netra and urja we have other projects as well by, by our ex research fellows so you can uh, go to their projects as well and learn what they did and many of you we uh, also give scholarships to students who are worth it. So here is the scholarship link. I would request the students to also fill in the scholarship application so that we can go through your application and uh, obviously give a scholarship because uh, I because we think those who are really into research and are looking forward for great research work, they should be supported with the scholarship. So here is the form and we would be looking forward to your registrations and applications as well. 
Now coming to our upcoming program that is on precision medicine. This program would be starting on July 6th. It would be a month training and would end on August 5th. And uh, we have a free webinar tomorrow at 8 p.m. where we would be discussing about the program. We would be discussing the session details as well and what all would be covered and why this program is necessary. So those who want to learn more about the program now and also register themselves, here is the link for you. You can just go to this program page here. All the details of the program uh, is mentioned and also the session details uh, with their topics and what all would be covered is mentioned in the program page. Now, taking forward to the social media, I really want that we all stay connected and also you stay updated with all our ongoing and upcoming programs and projects because we see that bioinformatics is changing the uh, era of research and we need not miss out on any such opportunity which could help us learn more about the bioinformatics tools and also different sorts of uh, advances in the research. So to stay updated, you can follow us on LinkedIn. Also, Hrde had shared the links of our Telegram and uh, WhatsApp groups. So here, uh, here is, is the LinkedIn uh, group link as well. You, you can be a part of a group. And also we have so many experts as part of a group. So they would be there to help you as well. And on Facebook, we are by the name of Pine Biotech. You can follow us there as well. So we are spread all across, uh, across so that uh, you have no issue finding us anywhere. And you can stay in touch with us and uh, get updates on all our upcoming programs. And if you have any doubts, you can anytime mail me at marketing at the rate pine.bio and I would be there to help you out. Thank you so much, Ruthvi, for conducting such a wonderful session. And we have the Siomics session every Thursday. So we would be meeting you again next Thursday. Let's see who we have as speakers. Ruthvi would be updating you all with it soon. Thank you everyone for being a part of us for the webinar. And uh, those who have any doubts uh, regarding Urjas or Netra's projects, you can mail them and get in touch with them. And if any other uh, query you have regarding the programs or the, uh, re the registrations or applications or scholarships, uh, your, you can any, anytime mail me at the uh, email ID, which I've shared with you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Ruthvi. Thank you, Sanadika. Bye. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye, Ruthvi.